Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's Revive webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARD-P. My name is Astrid Pensmore, and I'm hosting this webinar on advanced and complex in vivo models for infectious disease research. In 2018, GARD-P has launched the education and outreach program, Revive. Revive aims to connect and support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge, and connecting people. <clears throat> These webinars are part of our educational activities. All webinars are recorded and can be viewed after the live broadcast on our website revive.gardp.org slash webinars. Here you can also find the recording of our first webinar on in vivo models for infectious disease research, which was presented by William Weiss last June. As usual, today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions window in your webinar control panel as shown on the slide. We will address your questions after the presentation and we will do our best to respond to as many questions as possible. Today's speaker is Peter Warren and our moderator is William Weiss, Director of Preclinical Services at the University of North Texas System College of Pharmacy. Welcome Peter and William. William, I'm now handing over to you. Uh, thank you, Astrid. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Warren. Peter is the Senior Vice President of Anti-Infective Discovery at Evotech, and he holds a PhD degree in Medical Sciences from University of Manchester, where he was a senior lecturer for quite a while uh, with a group investigating pathogenesis and treatment of severe infections. He's authored over 70 research papers on the subject, and over 400 conference abstracts. He's been awarded multiple grants from your organizations such as the Wellcome Trust, uh, NIH, and the NIAID. In 2008, Peter helped set up a, a small contract research organization uh, in Manchester called Uprotect, which was acquired by a much larger company, Evotech, in 2014. Um, Evotech, Uprotech has been doing this type of work that Peter will be describing for several years, including in vitro microbiology, hollow fiber, and a multitude of the in vivo models that Peter will go into a little bit more depth on. And I don't want to take away too much time from your talk, Peter. Uh, I've known Peter for quite a few years, and I'm looking forward to his talk. So, thanks very much for the introduction, Bill. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's great for you um, all to join me for this presentation, which hopefully you will find um, interesting. Um, first of all, I need to um, give uh, my disclosure. Um, I'm an employee of Evotech uh, UK, which is a CRO. And as such, I work with numerous companies under fee -for service agreements. And some of the data I'll be presenting were, were performed under these fee -for service agreements. So I'd, I'd like to start off really where, um, where Bill finished um, in his presentation in June 2019, just a couple of months ago. Um, so in the, at the end of the fabulous talk he gave, he, he really gave us some, some pointers to the way we should be um, uh, working as far as possible. Um, he said we had to think very carefully about the uh, animal species, the strain and the gender. And I'll try to cover some of these points in more detail. We've also got to think very carefully about the pathogen and check that it reproducibly infects the host. We've got to think about the dosing regimens you're using and ensure we get the appropriate exposure of the test article in the animal at the infectious site, infected site. We've got to use appropriate formulations to ensure it gets there properly. And I'm going to spend quite a lot of time talking about experimental endpoints and hopefully um, show that these are clinically relevant. If we design our experiments correctly, they should accurately reflect the clinical disease state and the progression we see in humans. Um, this, this can be very tough in, at times, but I think in, in many cases we can achieve this. The endpoints should be clinically relevant and hopefully um, they should be able to evaluate the antimicrobial treatment to help predict clinical success and, um, and help progress the drugs. 
So it's clearly impossible to cover all the potential animal models in a relatively short presentation. So what I've decided to do is focus on the, um, the greatest needs identified in the WHO critical and priority uh, bacterial lists. And to remind you, the critical list of bacteria are um, Acinetobacter baumannii, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and a variety of Enterobacteriaceae. And as we, we, we are, I'm sure we all know, these are common hospital pathogens. Um, they're, they're not so frequently seen in the community. And, and unfortunately, there's been no new drug classes for these for over 40 years. So there certainly is a great need to develop new therapies. And I'm also going to have time to dip in briefly to the, some of the high priority pathogens. I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time talking about a few models of wound infect, infecting bacteria. Unfortunately, due to the, um, uh, the, the amount I need to cover, I won't have um, time to cover um, the bacteria that call the models um, uh, for severe malaria or models for sexually transmitted diseases. Um, in addition, I, I, I've also tried to uh, frame the presentation so that we're looking at areas of the greatest clinical need. Uh, and I think at this time, uh, again, based on some, some recent um, WHO documents, the, the areas of greatest clinical need are, are therapeutics for hospital acquired pneumonia, um, also for severe wound infections. And, and whilst it's not on the critical list, I'm also at the end of the presentation just going to give a couple of slides on, on models of C. difficile associated disease, um, because this seems to be a, an area where there's a lot of interest in models at this time. So first of all, let's jump in at the deep end. Um, I want to talk about um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa models. And initially, I'm going to talk about models of, uh, of thigh muscle infection and acute pneumonia models. So Pseudomonas is a pathogen where there's a great clinical need for therapeutics because it's intrinsically resistant to, to many drugs. Um, it rapidly develops treatments to become uh, multi-drug resistant. And it's associated with a wide range of infections in both acute and chronic diseases. Unfortunately, strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa are really variable, highly variable, and, and they often express um, infection site-specific virulence factors. That's to say that a strain which causes um, a diabetic ulcer, um, it probably is not going to be fully virulent in a, in a model of invasive pneumonia. And we have to be very cognizant of this when we're, when we're looking for strains. But fortunately, there's a very wide variety of strains available from public repositories from a, from a range of um, acute and chronic diseases um, from, from a variety of infection sites and with susceptibilities ranging from fully susceptible through to multidrug resistance. Um, this is an example of a few things I'm going to give in this presentation where I think there are some messages which are, which, which are quite important. And, and I think the first message is that caution should be um, should be exercised with certain strains, particularly Pseudomonas um, originosa PA01. This is a widely distributed strain, and many people have shared it between laboratories. But this is a strain with significant genetic drift, um, which has occurred since it was first isolated. And and when this um, is is uh, is used in in a variety of laboratories, we see a great range of phenotypes, and this can really impact the way infection and infection establishes um, and the um, and the therapeutic outcome. So, so um, if, if you're using strains, please always go back to the, to the original depositor wherever possible, because because particularly with pseudomonas, this genetic drift is is a, is a significant issue. And the other, uh, I guess, warning with pseudomonas aeruginosa is, is it's quite predictable. Uh, unpredictable. Um, the, 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 the way it reacts inside of an animal is highly variable, with some strains resulting in very rapid death, um, and perhaps only in, in four to six hours, whereas other strains are actually really quite benign and don't generate a, an infection, even in severely compromised hosts. Uh, and really, um, the message is that when you use these strains and validating them, first of all, um, watch the animals very carefully because they can go from, uh, from being completely healthy to being moribund in, 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 in just an hour or so. 
So with these models, what can we what what can we do? Well, we first of all can look at the animal species and strain. Um, the vast majority of models are, are performed in mice and rats. I'd, I'd like to have time to talk about some other species, but but really there's 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 not time. And the vast majority of development programs would focus on these hosts. We can look at a variety of infection sites. And I'm going to cover very briefly the Pseudomonas thigh burden studies and pneumonia, but actually the strain is also pathogenic in models of IP sepsis, IV sepsis, a, a wide variety of wound infections, and it's also a causative agent of UTI. All these can be modelled in rodents. When I set these um, studies up initially, one of my first questions is, what disease are you trying to model? Because we try to get the um, clinical condition, the precondition of the mice to, to match the, the disease we are um, we're trying to reflect. So mice can be naive, they can be immune compromised, they can be pre-diabetic or, or fully diabetic. As previously mentioned, we've got to be extremely careful in the, the range of strains we, we, we select, and these should be relevant to the model and also the therapeutic product profile. Um, uh, we can work with some more traditional small molecules. We can work with uh, large molecules, biologics. Um, there are multiple models of antivirus factors with Pseudomonas. Um, we, can, we can try to impact host factors to alter the infectious process. And also we can, um, for some of the chronic models, look at the efficacy of vaccines. Throughout this presentation, I've tried to divide the models into, I guess, three general classes. I, I call these acute, and these are for models which are five to 12 hours long subacute, which are 13 hours to two days long, and three days or longer I consider to be chronic models. When, when choosing the model, you should really think about the uh, stage development of your, of your test article and the purpose of the study. Many of the studies that are performed are actually quite early um, discovery, and for those it may be quite appropriate to use acute models. These are, are much more um, uh, compliant with the three R's, but at times we have to go into much more complex, longer term models, where particularly when we're looking at the uh, pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics of drugs. And also when we're trying to define the, uh, work out the estimated dose in man. Um, we're able to look at multiple endpoints and I'll try to cover all of these in the next uh, series of slides. And um, we can look at survival, we can look at burden. We can look at imaging in real time in animals and look at multiple time points with imaging using devices such as IVIS and labeled organisms. Um, as endpoints, we can also look at histology. Um, we can look at lung function using plasmography or, or blood oxygenation. And we can also look at cellular or cytokine responses. So in, in the next series of slides, I want to look at um, an example of profiling a test article in both a thigh muscle infection and pneumonia model to determine the pharmacodynamic driver of efficacy. And at the same time, we can look at potency and, and, and determine the dose um, to, to achieve stasis and, and efficacy um, uh, in, in excess of stasis. In this study, um, we, we used male CD1 mice. Um, a very reasonable question to ask is, why do we use males only? Why didn't we use females? Well, actually, the, these models work equally well in males and females, but unfortunately, the um, burdens and the um, outcome of treatment in males and females at times can be slightly different. So um, uh, if, if these studies are run in mixed sex models, generally the, the, the group sizes have to be slightly larger to account for the higher variance. Um, there are some um, particular um, issues with using male mice. The, this, this study was performed with um, sub-adults about um, six to eight weeks old. Um, many older males, when they, when they become fully sexually mature, actually make very poor housemates uh, and, and cause a lot of fighting. And in those circumstances, we often have to uh, switch to females. Um, also in this study, mice were rendered neutropenic uh, using two doses of cyclophosphamide. For the thigh burden studies, we used 150 mg, followed by 100 mg per kg on days minus four and day minus one. And for the pneumonia studies, we used a little bit more of psychophosphamide with 200 mg on day minus four and 100 mg per kg on day minus one. And, and I've just got a comment about the way cyclophosphamide is administered. In, in many publications, um, it's been administered by the intraperitoneal route. Um, 
we, we all should be aware that this route of administration can lead to a significant um, risk of misdosing. And even in the most expert hands, possibly 15 or 20 percent of doses don't go into the peritoneal cavity. Uh, and we should also be aware that this is quite painful for rodents. Um, whilst I'm not presenting the, the, the data in, in this short, short webinar, we, we've demonstrated that administration of these drugs by the subcutaneous route is actually equivalent, so we don't have to change the dose at all. Um, so, so as new models are developed, we, we've now really switched completely over to the subcutaneous route for cyclophosphamide. Um, in, in both of these studies, both the um, uh, thigh burden and the acute pneumonia study, the mice were anaesthetized with isoflurane to allow us to infect the animals. And then the animals were either were infected with 50 microliters of a bacterial suspension, either into the lateral thigh muscle or intranasally. Um, and, and one other thing we, we, we tend to do wherever possible, we admit analgesia whilst the animals are under anaesthetic because either the, the procedures themselves are painful or the disease is, is unpleasant for the animals. Um, for, for many studies, we would tend to use an opiate, uh, buprenorphine, at 0.03 mg per kg. Um, we, we, we tend to use buprenorphine rather than some alternatives such as carprofen or meloxicam um, because these could have an impact on, on, on COX-2 and, and, and change the immune response. Um, but uh, but, but um, uh, opiates and buprenorphine isn't appropriate for every, um, in every case and needs to be validated for each experiment. So, so in this experiment, um, animals were the, the, the initiation of treatment was two hours post-infection, and we used two different times for the endpoint. The first endpoint was two hours post-infection to give us a pre-treatment burden, which is very critical when we're analysing the um, potency of the drug, and, and, and a second endpoint at 26 hours post-infection. Because these studies were to be used to determine the pharmacodynamic driver, we also had to perform quite a large series of PK studies, uh, and we performed these on infected mice. Um, often it's, it's completely appropriate to perform studies in, in naive mice, but, the, but as animals become sick, the volumes of distribution do change, and so wherever possible, we, 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 we tend to try to run these studies in infected mice. Um, where lung levels were required, um, endothelial lining fluid was collected using a bronchial alveolar lavage technique. Um, in, this, um, in this slide, we have two figures. In the left-hand side, there is the uh, plasma levels, and in the right-hand um, side, there, there are, there's the uh, endothelial lining fluid levels of the drug. In both cases, these have been corrected for the free drug fraction. Um, normally in these studies, we're, we're much less interested in the total drug, uh, but we're, we're, we're much more interested in the free fraction, which is the piece which isn't um, uh, bound up by um, uh, plasma proteins. And so we can see if we look, first of all, the left-hand panel, that we, we get a rather a nice dose response and predictable dose response um, with, with a half-life of, um, uh, of an hour or two. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see that the endothelial lining fluid levels are rather more uh, variable, and this is because, first of all, drug has to get into a second compartment, and also collection, collecting this sort of samples is quite difficult and leads to increased variance. When we collect the data, we do a small amount of modelling. The first thing we want to check is that the PK is linear. If it's not linear, that's not a disaster, but it does require extra modelling. In the, um, in, in the uh, figure on the, the left-hand side, we're looking at uh, the, the um, AUC, or the exposure, in both um, the, the, the uh, thigh and the lung, and we're comparing the dose, uh, sorry, the thigh infection models and the lung infection models, and we're comparing the dose to the AUC. And we can see there's a great relationship, which goes, which is almost at a one-to-one -one ratio, um, uh, and, and the, the, this is very well correlated. So this tells us this drug behaves fairly well. In the right-hand panel, we've actually compared the, um, the, the exposure in plasma and, and ELF. And again, we show that the drug gets into ELF very nicely. So this means that we can run our studies quite nicely in plasma uh, and then look at the exposure and, uh, um, in, in, the, in the ELF and hopefully derive some very nice pharmacodynamic responses. The next thing to do is we need to run um, a dose response model, an infection model. So in this case, the um, animals were infected into the thigh muscle, as I've already described. 
Um, the data on the on the left hand side in, in the grey um, is the uh, pretreatment data. So this is the burden from animals two hours post infection. And they had roughly 10 to the 7 CFU at two hours post infection. The, the, the next data set is for the um, is for the burdens in the thigh. The vehicle treated animals at 26 hours post infection, and we get about a two or two and a half log increase in burden. And this is very acceptable. We, if wherever possible, we hope to see greater than one log increase in burden. Um, we then treated the animals with an increasing uh, doses from 3.75 to 60 mg per kg, and we were able to show a very nice dose response. We then um, uh, do a, a small amount of data analysis where we um, transform the doses to the, the log 10 dose along the x-axis. And the thigh burden um, is also plotted against the log 10 CFU and an aggression line drawn through the, the, the data sets generated. From this data set, we can get a couple of early pieces of information. The first thing we can see with the with the top dotted line is the dose that's required to achieve stasis. So the animals in at two hours had just around 10 to the seven, and we can look down and we can determine exactly the dose to achieve stasis. We can also look at the dose to achieve a one log below stasis and two logs below stasis. And these are quite important when you're trying to compare um, but compare the efficacy of the drug. But this is only um, um, uh, at this time based on, on mix per kg. Before we can start doing dose fractionation studies and work out the pharmacodynamic drivers, we've got to start thinking roughly about the doses that we want to use for a dose fractionation study. Often it's very difficult to get this right in the, on the first attempt because um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the dose response you get is highly dependent on the regimen you use in the first study. Uh, uh, you, you could get a, a, a very different dose response for an infrequent dosing, so once or twice, uh, once or twice a day dosed um, uh, model compared to a, a multiple dose model. But what we try to do is initially define the dose that um, leads to a, a roughly a 10% reduction in burden compared to vehicle, a 40%, a 60% and a 90% reduction in burden compared to vehicle. Once we've got those, um, we've calculated those doses, we then, we then generate a table where we look at a, a series of total daily doses. So if we look at the right hand column, the total daily dose for a 10% reduction in burden required three mg per kg. For a 40% reduction in burden, required eight mg per kg. For a 60% reduction in burden, 13, one three mg per kg. And for a 90% reduction in burden, we required uh, 30 mg per kg per day. Each of those daily, uh, total daily doses is then fractionated into the whole lot being given in a single dose, that's called Q24 hours. Half the dose is given every 12 hours. A quarter of the dose is given every six hours. And uh, or an eighth of the dose is given every three hours. Um, we can at this stage also um, transform the data into the appropriate pharmacodynamic parameters. So in this case, I've simply changed the doses. Uh, and if you look at the headings of the, of the columns, I'll be, uh, they're, they're either now expressed as the free drug AUC, the free drug CMAX, or the free drug percentage of time above a threshold value. In this case, I've called it MIC, but it can actually be any, any threshold value we, we, we like to assign. So when we have this information, we can then run the run, run a study. Um, we tend to use about some four mice per group. So, so this this is um, this would be quite a, um, a, a large study with nearly 70 mice running in it. Um, so we run the study and and uh, and uh, and we generate a, a rather nice regression curve. You'll notice now I'm, I'm not um, I haven't done a mix per kg along the bottom axis. I've now transformed the data into one of the appropriate pharmacodynamic drivers. So so in this case, this is the free drug AUC divided by the um, MIC. This is data generated from the thigh, and I've also put indication of the Day of, of the exposure required to generate stasis, one log below stasis and two logs below stasis. 
The, the other um, um, information on this figure is an R squared. This is a correlation coefficient. An R squared of 0.85 means this is actually very well correlated. And a, a, a correlation coefficient of one is perfect. Uh, and we would hope always to have, um, um, for, for the appropriate pharmacem driver, a correlation coefficient of probably above 0.7 um, uh, to, to, to indicate that we have the right driver. We then repeat the, the plotting of the data, so using exactly the same data, but we plot the data against the, the free drug Cmax over MIC and the free drug percentage time above MIC. And if you look at the three R squared values, you can quite clearly see that the um, value for the AUC over MIC is, is the highest number. And so this is um, likely to be the, the pharmacodynamic driver of, of efficacy. We can also then go on to compare the, so, so you've already seen the figure on the left-hand side, this is the thigh burden data. We can run exactly the same experiment with the, um, with the uh, lung data, uh, and, um, uh, and in which case we can then, um, we can see again, we get a very good correlation, so it tells us that the, the driver is the same for a thigh burden infection and lung infection. And finally, we can look at the, um, compare the um, exposure in the LF to the burden to know that actually it's not just the, 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 the whole uh, lung data, but actually the, the, the PK within the lung um, is reflective activity. So in this case, I think we can be quite confident that the, um, that the driver of efficacy is AUC. It, it's, um, it's confirmed across all the infection sites. And, um, uh, and we also have an estimate of the amount of drug required to, to achieve stasis one and two logs below stasis. So I now want to go into a little bit of a deeper dive into models of bacteria pneumonia. As I've mentioned, these have been done in many strains, uh, many animal species, sorry. Um, the, the day, most people work with mice and rats, but for antiviral work, cotton rats are a very common host. For fungal work, guinea pigs are a common host. And, and I guess the, um, the uh, most uh, sophisticated models would be in mini pigs. The questions I'm asking about preconditioning are identical to the, to, the, uh, to the previous example, but in this case, when we look at pneumonia, we have some additional options. We can overinflate the lungs to cause physical damage. We can um, cause fibrosis using, using chemicals, or we can expose them to irritants such as uh, tobacco smoke. In models of pneumonia, it's also possible to use a single bacterial species or multiple species. Uh, and one thing I want to go into in, in rather a lot of detail is that the way we infect the animals, we can infect the animals by the intranasal route, intratracheal routes, aerosols, or, or, or pharyngeal routes. Some of these methods are fairly complicated, some are fairly basic. These models are suitable for treatment in exactly the same way as previously, with small molecules, large molecules, biologics, um, etc. cetera. We, I classify the models the same way, um, acute, subacute, and chronic. And um, we use the acute models for very early drugs, going on to subacute pharmacodynamic, and in specific circumstances, we use chronic models of infection. The endpoints are very similar, but there are a couple of additional endpoints that we can use, particularly with lung function. So I, I want to go through something which I guess is a challenge for many of us who work in this area. This is working with us to back to Bamanii, uh, where there certainly is a great need for new therapeutics. In general, Acinetobacter grows really quite poorly in lungs, and many strains hardly achieve stasis over 24 hours in a neutropenic model. So what I've tried to do in the next couple of slides is highlight the impact of very small changes in, in methodology on the outcomes, and hopefully will help you to um, generate some improved data. So in this series of slides, I'm going to compare the impact of treating, of infecting the animals by the intranasal route, intratracheal route, or, 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 or in pharyngeal aspiration techniques uh, using a couple of um, multidrug resistant strains of Acinetobacter baumannii. The studies were again performed in male CD1 mice. The animals are rendered neutropenic with two doses of cyclophosphamide. In this case, we use slightly lower um, levels of immunosuppression with 150 mg on day minus four and 100 mg per kg on day minus one. Mice were anesthetized with 2.5% um, isoflurane in 97.5% oxygen. And then, then they were infected with 50 microliters of a bacterial suspension. 
and so we wanted so the aim of the study was to evaluate the time course of pneumonia induced by a million CFU of two different strains of multidrug resistant acinetobacterium baumannii and we administered them using these three different techniques IN, IT and OP or pharyngeal. We then went on to compare the efficacy of tigercycline in reducing the bacterial load following intratracheal or oral pharyngeal administration. And we also looked at the inflammation of the lungs and following these two routes in terms of histology and, and measurement of leukocytes, which you, which you can do throughout the study. So let's just very briefly um, cover the three techniques. So intranasal techniques, I guess, is the, the easiest technique to use. Mice are anesthetized. Um, and then restrained. The level of anesthesia has to be um, sufficient that the animals um, are able to uh, breathe in a droplet on the end of the nose, so they are fairly deeply anesthetized. In this study, this was done with, with isoflurane inhalation, but in many cases, we use a parental um, um, anesthesia, which renders the animals unconscious for 30, 40 minutes. And in that case, we um, suspend the um, the, the, the mice by the teeth from a, from a, a cord uh, to allow the organisms to penetrate deeply in the lung. But in this study, they were just temporarily um, uh, anesthetized with isoflurane. The intratracheal intra route used was a non-surgical route. So the animals um, had a speculum placed down through, their, through the mouth, through their uh, vocal cords into trachea. And then using the Halliwell system, we were able to um, deposit the organisms directly into the lung at the bifurcation. The oropharyngeal route is, is very simple. The mice are anesthetized. You block off the, uh, the nose of the animals temporarily and put the 50 microliters of bacteria on the rear of the tongue. And the animals then inhale it deeply into the lung, rather like an aspiration pneumonia would occur in, in, in patients. Um, now, if you look at the two panels, the left-hand panel is the first strain, strain ACC001, and the right-hand panel, strain ACC002. In each case, we have the three different routes of infection along the bottom. In, in dark blue is intranasal, in green, intratracheal, and in red, um, oropharyngeal. For both strains, we can see that the intranasal route of administration actually hardly established an infection at all, and in some cases led to clearance of the bacteria. In contrast, in, as, as, I guess as we, we would expect, the intratracheal route led to a, a, a really good in, increase in burden of roughly two, of just under two logs. Um, but um, uh, similarly, the, um, the animals infected by the oropharyngeal route also had a very good increase in burden between two and 26 hours of, of um, over two, two logs um, and, and for one strain and about a log and a half the other strain. So, so simply changing the route of infection has allowed us to work with two very interesting acinetobacter strains which would not have been possible with, with, with the um, intr intranasal administration. Um, we also get, so this figure is laid out in the same way, um, with, with just a single, I've only shown an example of one of the strains. So in both cases, with intratracheal and oropharyngeal, we got a great increase in burden between the light blue and the dark blue at two hours and 26 hours. And tigercycline um, was highly effective at reducing the burden. Uh, and, and this data hopefully shows that um, the, the, these models actually both respond to treatment in a, in a similar fashion. Um, histologically, um, we were able to demonstrate that, um, that the vehicle treated animals had, had very severe pneumonia with a, multi, with a multifocal inflammatory ice, um, infiltrate, that the infiltrates were mo mostly um, mononucleus with a small number of neutrophils. Um, we could clearly see after 24 or 26 hours large numbers of bacteria in the vehicle treated mice, but actually the, the, the burden in the tigercycline treated mice was below the limited detection. And I think we can say at the end of this, that the intratracheal and oropharyngeal routes both had very similar outcomes, but technically the oropharyngeal route is, is much simpler and, and perhaps should be something we think about when we're running um, uh, models of Acinetobacter burmanii. At times, the, the acute models we run aren't suitable. Um, and in general, animal models are, are, are quite difficult to run, or chronic animal models are quite difficult to run. But there are circumstances when we need to do this, particularly with Pseudomonas, because it is associated with chronic infections, and these are often due to quite complex um, biofilms, including um, CF, um, 
uh, exacerbation of COPD, diabetic ulcers, and actually just general wound infections. Um, Whilst, as I said, whilst the acute models are, are suitable for many developmental programs, for, for, for particular programs, and certainly for the diseases I, I've highlighted, we need a much more chronic model. Unfortunately, there are, this sort of model is available for, for pseudomonas. So um, in these studies, we, we switched to rats. Um, uh, they were male CD rats, but actually the study also can be optimized to work in quite a few strains of mice. The infection was with a, um, a fluorescently labelled tag, uh, uh, sorry, a fluorescently labelled strain of, of Pseudomonas originosa, the Zen 41 strain, and this was embedded into agarose beads. I haven't got time to go through the, um, the, the methodology of doing this, but there's some excellent manuscripts, including a, a Job manuscript where you can see this happening in real time. Um, and the animals were infected by non-surgical intratracheal administration um, using a system very similar to the, the one I, I, I showed previously. So the animals were anaesthetized and then they were infected with roughly 10 to the 6 logs, uh, sorry, uh, log CFU per rat um, with, uh, and with the bacteria suspended in the beads. You can initiate treatment between one and three days post-infection, and there are multiple endpoints we can use, including IVIS, and I'll show some examples of that, but also body weight, body temperature, and clinical, clinical score are really valuable. Um, just a, a tip, when you're using a clinical scoring system, please ensure that um, you, you have a, a very defined schematic, So, so, so because often these studies are observed by multiple people to ensure consistency, and later on I'll show a, an example of this also. We can look at um, lung function, we can look at ex vivo um, bioluminescence, we can also count the numbers of bacteria in the lung, the trachea and the blood, and these are also very suitable for macroscopic examination on gross, gross pathology and also histopathology, and we can also do white counts and cytokine analysis. So um, in, in the top panel, I've shown the, the, the burden, the number of pseudomonas uh, between days two and days 15. You can see on day, day two, we have roughly 10 to the eight, but these numbers reduce very gradually over this um, two week period, reducing to uh, just below 10 to the six at 15 days. In the bottom panel, I've shown the mortality. And whilst in the study, you do get some early mortality with the strain from, from days two through 15, the model is very stable. If we now look at what we see in the animal itself, um, we have um, in, 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 in each case on, on uh, the, uh, uh, the gross pathology of, of the lung and, and IVIS imaging. So on day two, you can see very large hemorrhagic lesions and extremely large numbers of bacteria spread throughout the entire lung. Then looking at the gross um, uh, pathology of the, uh, of the lungs between days two and 15, you can see uh, resolution of the, of the hemorrhagic lesions, but, uh, but on the onset of quite severe fibrosis. In, in parallel to that, um, you can see reductions um, in the number or in the fluorescent signal indicating reduced um, uh, numbers of bacteria, but you, you see some very um, hot, uh, very bright hot spots, which are, um, which are abscesses caused by the pseudomonas. Um, this is also reflected in the histology. Um, by day seven, you've got a, a very large inflammatory response. And by day 15, you have a, a definite formation of abscesses in the lung parenchyme. Um, this is also reflected by, uh, in, in the um, cellular response um, in terms of leukocytes, T cells and, and neutrophils. So the empty bees had, a, had almost no impact at all compared to naive animals. But by day two, we had a fantastic inflammatory response. The T cell response took a took slightly longer and didn't really um, come up until um, uh, towards 10 days. But neutrophils were, were were raised from day one. So there are multiple particular uh, multiple endpoints we can use in this study. So now um, I don't have a huge amount of time left, so I'm now going to do a whistle stop tour through a couple of other models which may be of use. Um, so the first thing I want to think about are the wound infection bacteria, particularly MRSA, but these models also work for certain strains of vancomycin resistant enterococcus. We can run these in, in mice, rats, guinea pigs, and also mini pigs. 
and there are a huge range of potential models including thigh burden wound infections and sepsis also we can do biofilm models we, we can do implant models um, joint infection models uh, and, and these models were actually quite nicely summarized by um by, by a recent manuscript unfortunately the um the the, the uh, authors come off the bottom of this uh, but i can supply the reference to, to anybody who, who requires it um so so th this model gives a representation of all the sorts of wounds that you that you that you could potentially use in a rodent I want to talk about just a, a, a couple of particular um, models. So you see, so you'll be getting quite used to this slide now. We can we can do lots of things. We can do thigh burden studies, wound studies, joint infections, implants, etc. Again, we've got to think about what the what the um, th the therapeutic profile of the drug is going to be when we're setting up the the model. There's quite a wide range of strains. Many strains of MRSA work very nicely in these models um, with, with vancomycin resistant coccus, that the strain selection is rather narrower and, and, and uh, probably only five or 10 percent of strains are, are suitable. We can have the same treatment interventions, but one of the additional treatments that we can use in these models are topical therapies. And in this case, models I tend to think these are subacute or chronic. There are a whole series of endpoints that we've already spoken about we can use, um, but uh, particularly things like IVIS are, are extremely important. It's very easy to, to image um, uh, infections in the, um, in the skin of mice and rats, but there are a variety of other endpoints, um, including histology, which are, which are extremely useful. So the data I want to, to talk about are in, um, uh, were performed in male CD1 mice. In many cases, we actually use hairless mice, such as SKH1, which are an outbred hairless mice, but when, when, when IVIS imaging is used. These animals were naive, that means to say they weren't immunosuppressed in any way. The animals were infected with 10 to the 8 CFU of Staph aureus ATCC29213. The animals were, were infected by a very simple subcutaneous injection in, in 50 microliters of a bacterial suspension. And similar to the previous studies, we administered analgesia, which was buprenorphine, whilst the animals were still under anaesthetic, and that was repeated um, every eight hours throughout the study. Treatment was initiated, initiated quite early. And the endpoints were slightly different. In this case, we were looking at the wound itself and wound healing. So we looked at, we, we digitally captured pictures of the wound and scored them for size and severity. We were able to do daily skin swabs to measure changes in burden. And you can also do terminal um, skin and tissue burdens um, you can, um, in parallel to histology uh, to, to, to determine reepithelization and wound healing. Um, this is an example of the score sheet we use very routinely in models. Um, so um, what we've done in this circumstance is we, we've scored wounds from a score of zero where there's no visible lesion through to um, a, a score five where we get total destruction of the wound and extensive invasion. You'll notice I actually haven't got a picture of, um, of, of an animal with score five because we, we believe that um, score four is sufficiently severe um, to, to um, uh, terminate the model. So when animals hit score f a score of four, they, they, they then have the maximum severity we're able to, to work with. So in this model, we see very early on within, within two hours, we see a white blanched area forming at the site of administration. We see um, uh, uh, by, by day one, we see quite significant lesions, uh, which, which were sort of between two and three, um, uh, with mildly, which are mildly indurated. And the infection process uh, gets increasingly severe and, and vehicle treated animals by day four have hit the score four. So that's the end point really for the study that we would use. Um, in the bottom figures, we've got on, on the left-hand side a very simple um, scoring, clinical scoring um, sheet where the um, vehicle-treated animals are in red, and we can see between days one and day four they, they generate wounds. Um, but by by the first day, they they already um, have a have a wound with a score of between one and two, and they stabilise at about that level. Um, treatments are um, were, were done at a couple of doses, either with flu, uh, flucloxacillin or vancomycin. And what we can see in, in the, the, the bottom left-hand figure is that vancomycin at the higher dose actually led to, to quite rapid wound resolution. And this was reflected in the right-hand panel um, in terms of the CFU um, recovered from swabs. Um, so at pre-treatment, we had around uh, three times 10 to the four. This uh, deteriorated over the, the period of the model. Um, and at four days, we get almost 10 to the seven CFU. 
and, and treatment with vancomycin, was, 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 even this very low dose of vancomycin, was, was fairly effective. We can we can actually do a slightly more sophisticated model. Um, in this case, this is um, a skin model um, in, in a rat, which is an excisional model. So the first thing we do is we actually um, suture a wound chamber. This is rather like an um, uh, acrylic ring with a with a cap. These are sutured in place over the sites where wounds are going to be made. Um, the reason for we, we actually suture these things in place is because rodents tend to um, heal uh, excisional wounds by, by contraction of the wound. So if you don't suture it open, um, you don't allow re epithelization to occur and wound healing from the base upwards. So it's very important in rats and mice actually to, 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 to keep the, the, the wounds open. So then we make two excisional wounds using a punch barb C. These are eight millimeters in rats and either four or five millimeters in mice. Uh, we tend to use paired wounds. So um, when we um, um, you, you, uh, have systemic therapy, one wound is infected and one wound is uninfected, and we photo image both of these. And for topical treatments, one, but the both wounds are infected, but one is actively treated and one is treated with vehicle. The the um, the, the uh, excisional wounds are uh, photographed daily, and we can also take samples for culture if required. We can also, if needed, we can pre-infect the wounds with with biofilms of organisms. And finally, we can connect uh, collect terminal samples for culture and histopathology. Uh, and really, very briefly, um, in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the acrylic discs um, with um, vehicle-treated animals. Um, uh, 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 deteriorating over a period of time to make quite large, quite, quite large ulcers. Um, there's a really wide range of, um, of endpoints we can use, which I really don't have time to go into at this time, but they're listed on the left-hand side of, of this figure. And finally and briefly, I, I want to go through models of Clostridium difficile. Um, as I said, whilst they're not on the WHO critical list, there is still a great need for new therapeutics. Um, and, and this is a, a, an example I've tried to use where we've got a therapeutic which has no impact on bacterial burden. So in this case, bacterial burden is not of, of, of any use to us. Um, and just to give you a reminder, um, um, in, in this, this schematic, um, green animals are in the areas in green are when the animals are healthy, and in red, the animals become infected. So we follow the blue line. Um, we, we first of all, the, the animals are, are come in healthy. We then precondition them to cause a dysbiosis. Um, at, at, um, at, we, we then infect the animals at, at some time point later. So um, if we treat the animals with, with vancomycin, they um, they, they, they uh, recover, um, and animals that aren't treated with vancomycin would, would, um, would succumb in the primary infection. But one of the big problems with, um, with models of C. difficile is that whilst um, vancomycin is very effective in short-term therapy, um, when treatment it was withdrawn, the animals um, uh, uh, develop a, a secondary disease or a second bout of the C. difficile and require additional rounds of treatment. So, 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 in, so the models I'm going to show in just a moment can also be used to look at the recurrence cycle uh, because um, limiting recurrence is obviously a, a priority for, for, for drugs currently in development. So we can run these models either in hamsters, which is, I guess, the, the gold standard classical model, or in mice. The, the, the models work equally well in both species, but the, the preconditioning is slightly different. Um, in hamsters, you only need very mild preconditioning with a single dose of clindamycin a day before infection. Uh, for mice, we need very more, much more significant uh, preconditioning, and we use 10 days of kefaperazone, and that's actually in the drinking water. Um, we then withdraw that for a day and give a single dose of clindamycin. Then in both cases, um, uh, animals are infected with, with C. difficile um, on day zero. Vancomycin treatment needs to start quite early because the animals have the first symptom disease about 18 hours post-infection. And um, in both cases, they, the animals start to succumb between 30 and 48 hours post-infection. So in this model, we use fairly reasonable doses of vancomycin, 10 mg per kg, administered, uh, per dose, administered twice daily. The, the, the uh, second compound I, I just want to mention very briefly is a, is a monoclonal antibody targeting the, um, the toxin. Uh, and, and, and this was uh, given 50 mg per kg per dose um, uh, pre-infection. Pre 
Um, um, I think there are some a couple of very important technical notes when you're running C difficile models. Um, uh, the first of those is that it's extremely easy to cross-infect animals. Um, so, so when we run these studies, we always ensure we have a, a sentinel group that is handled in exactly the same way as the infected animals. And if these animals become infected, we consider that the, the study failed. It's, um, as I said, it, because the infectious challenge in enhances is probably just two or three spores. It's extremely easy um, uh, to, to transfer uh, transfer the the the, the, the pathogen. Um, so so I, I would strongly advise the sentinel group. Um, so these are figures of survival of, of the hamsters on the left hand side and mice on the right hand side. In both cases, vehicle treated animals succumbed very quickly, and um, within uh, two or three days, um, uh, many of the animals had died. So we had 100% mortality in the hamster model, and in this model, about 70% in, uh, in, in the mouse infection model. Um, if we now look at the green line, vancomycin was highly protective during the period of therapy and for about four or five days after the withdrawal of therapy. But in both cases, um, the animals went on to develop recurrent disease with 100% mortality between days 10 and 14 in the hamsters and 80% and mortality uh, between days 10 and 12 in, in the mouse. And treatment with the um, with the uh, monoclonal um, antitoxin, uh, sorry, the antitoxin monoclonal, um, led to um, about 40% survival in in the hamsters uh, and and 100% sorry and 90% survival in the mice. There are actually some really interesting um, um, low-tech um, um, endpoints you can also use in this sort of study. And what I've tried to show here is a, is a simple scoring system to look at the gross anatomy of the, uh, of the intestines at the end of the study, whether that's done as a, as a time kill study or, or, or as a eternal study. So what we've done in this instance is we, we take out the intestine, we place them onto um, a, a clean sheet of, of, um, of, of, of paper and, and um, and then examine their appearance. And that can vary from, from not completely normal, which would give a score of zero, through to a score around two, when the, when the, when the, the, the intestines are slightly inflamed and, and empty, going straight through to um, a score five, in which case the animals have megacolon or megaelium or, or, or hemorrhages throughout the system. And we score this for each part of the GI tract. And actually it can be, uh, it, it can be incredibly informative when you're trying to dissect the uh, potency of two closely related compounds. And, and just as a, a sort of final um, flag on that, that, that whilst we use the, the hamster and mouse models um, uh, routinely, they, they don't give us quite the same results. Um, in these two figures, we've got the uh, faecal um, uh, spore count um, in the vehicles, the monoclonal treated animals, and vancomycin treated animals. For for um, for the hamster model, there you'll see there's nothing in the vehicle treated animals. That's because all the animals succumb to treatment by the by the um, but by the time points tested. You'll, you'll also see that actually we have quite reasonable burdens in the monoclonal, but this did not result in death. Vancomycin, in contrast, suppressed the burdens completely for the first five days, but then there was an explosion in the burden at day 10 when the recurrent disease occurred. In contrast, in the, in the mouse models, the animals survived with some quite reasonable burdens. Um, even, uh, even the vehicle treated animals at the end of the study, there are burdens of, of hundreds to thousands of CFU per, per gram of feces. Um, treatment with the monoclonal actually led to better res resolution than, than the vehicle treated animals. And interestingly, animals in the recurrent disease, mice that were treated with vancomycin, actually had fairly high burdens throughout and would almost certainly have gone on to transmit this, this um, infection to, to other animals. So that's unfortunately all I've got time to present in, 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 in this uh, webinar. But really looking back at this, this bill summary, I think it's still very relevant. Hopefully I, we've covered many of the key points, but I think most importantly, what I've tried to do is, is show that we can act, accurately reflect the clinical disease um, and, and the disease that we have seen in humans. We can look at clinically relevant endpoints. And, and the, the examples of the drugs I, 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 I've used actually went on um, to progress through um, clinical trials uh, and are, are either in phase three or, or, or now licensed products. So these, these were very informative.
Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank all my um, colleagues and friends who, who've um, helped me uh, generate this data, both um, Evatech at Oldley Park, my, um, my colleagues at um, Aptuit based in Verona, or the mathematical modeling team uh, at Cipertex who are also based at Oldley Park. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, appreciate you filling this talk with such a lot of data in a short amount of time. Obviously, um, more time would be great to discuss it. We have a few questions we can start off with, and I'd like to remind all the listeners that they should use their window for submission of questions, and we'll do our best to get to all of them. So we'll start you off with an easy one, and the question I think refers to either maybe the thigh or the lung model, and what is the minimum delta CFU that you're looking for from start of treatment to, say, the the 26 or 48 hour vehicle controls um, that will make the model robust in order to accurately predict stasis, one log and two log reductions? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. So I can tell you the ideal answer and what sometimes we have to do. So I think there are two parameters we look at. It's not just the delta, it's also the, the, the variance in the burdens. Um, what, what we'd always hope to see is we'd like to see um, an absolute minimum of um, one log increase in burden, but that would only be acceptable if the variance is, is really low. And to be perfectly honest, that's rarely, um, that one log would be rarely acceptable. Much more commonly, we would go for a two log increase. Um, and if that means the study has to run out to, um, uh, to slightly longer than, than 24 hours, that's, that's completely fine. Um, the other thing I think that we need to note is that a lot of the increase in burden occurs over the first 12 or 14 hours. Um, quite often you get to a, a burden which doesn't increase. So some strains, you, you, you hit the, 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 the the maximum burden at about 14 and 15 hours. So after that, you're only getting increasing noise. But but to go back to your original question, I would really like a two log increase in burden, and that those 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 burdens should not have more than a one log variance, and okay. that then allows us to have smaller group sizes. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is actually two parts because I have one too about it: the Pseudomonas chronic lung infection model. Um, first part of that would be for a chronic model versus an acute where do you decide to start treatment after infection uh in some of the acute you're looking at like two hours four hours some of the chronic longer um and the second part of that for the chronic pseudomonas since it's a difficult infection what would you select as your positive control dosing and, and what would you expect the efficacy to look like okay so I, I would have liked to have included some of that in the presentation, but there wasn't really time. So um, let me start with the, the, the second question first. So, so we tend to use, so quite often people are interested in biologics in these models. There is no really good biologic to that, 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 in, that, that uh, generates a really robust reduction in burden. So unfortunately, we tend to stick to tobramycin. So we would use intratracheal tobramycin in most cases. Um, we also can use IV tobramycin, um, but, and we tend to go in for IV. We go in at around 10 mg per kg BID. Um, the IT uh, dose is, I think it's three micrograms go directly into the lung in the studies we performed. Um, I would much prefer to have a biologic or a, or um, a non-traditional comparator, but at this stage we don't have one. Now the second question is also really quite interesting. It depends what you're looking at. Um, I think we, we te we, because this is a clearance model, it's it's not a model which once the model is established, you you see very slow clearance from days two to day fifteen. Um, and so if you um, delay treatment very uh, for a long period of time that the group sizes to get significant um, numbers get, get quite large and these are fairly tough studies to run um, in, in the first place so we tend to delay this treatment for at least a day 
uh, and probably ideally for three days because at three days we've still got about we've got over 10 to the 7 CFU and if you treat for four to five days um, many of the therapeutics um, will, are, are able to to reduce the burden down to about 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3 CFU uh, um, uh, per lung so 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 that is acceptable but, but I do take the point, it's very tough. We, we like to delay treatment, but the longer that we delay the treatment, the larger the group sizes need to be to get, to get a statistically significant burden. And, and one of the things I didn't really have time to talk about is selection of strains in, in these models is really critical. There are a few published strains in the, um, in, in the chronic model one of those only, I think, is a multi-resistant um, strain. Most of them are fairly susceptible. The, 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 the I should think, 90% or more of pseudomonas strains are not suitable for the for the chronic model, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and another question, actually, was a little bit broad, but maybe you could comment on it. And it asked about situation where the mouse PK is much different than in human, in, in particular, half life, and how you might allow for that uh, or possibly your thoughts on if possible human equivalent dosing <laughs> okay um, a little broad, that's, sorry. A, that's, a, yeah, that's, that's a great question actually and I'll, I'll try to cover the way we do it and, and perhaps where other people can do it so I, I completely appreciate that so when when we design a study we like to administer drugs at no more than five half-lives so that means that um, for um, for a drug with a, a half life of um, 10 or 15 minutes, something like meropenem, you need to dose that really every hour or at the least frequent every 90 minutes to to, to get the maximal drug effect. So there are, are various ways of doing that. We tend to use uh, so the, the, I guess you can either use multiple injections. Now ethically, I, I'm, I'm I'm not sure what other people's licenses allow them to do, but we're not allowed to stick a needle into an animal more than six times in a 24-hour period. So this would limit us to um, to, to to Q4 hour dosing. Now that is not suitable for um, uh, for, for very short half-life drugs. So in that case, we would put a, a line into the animals and inject into the line. Um, in, in rats, it's fairly straightforward to put a, a, a femoral line in or a JVC line in, and then we would dose that at this sort of frequency I mentioned, five or six times the, um, the, the, the half-life. Um, for mice, that is really tough, and so we tend to use a subcutaneous line. IV lines um, are, are, are possible, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment, but a much simpler approach, much simpler surgical approach, is to use a subcutaneous line. So we implant a subcutaneous line and we dose then uh, at the appropriate pharmacodynamic interval. The, the when for, for, and that works very nicely for early stage discovery drugs. When we are looking at later stage drugs, we tend to infuse. So we infuse in both rats and mice. So the, so the animals have a, a, a JVC um, implanted into them. And we, we then um, use programmable infusion pumps and we try to mimic the PK. Um, the final way of doing it, because this is, that's takes quite a lot of technology and quite a lot of skills. So if we're running a 50 mouse model, that's a, we, we, we may have um, 20, 30 infusion pumps running in parallel. That's pretty tough. Um, one of the ways people have done this in the past, and there are quite a few publications, people use a fractionated dosing regimen. So for instance, if the um, half-life is uh, four hours in a human, or, or three hours in a human maybe, and the dosing is, is, is um, twice daily, what you do, you do a fractionated dose. So you give a significant dose at time point naught, and then 30 minutes later, you give half of that dose, maybe an hour later you give another half of that dose so you use lots of small fractions so instead of having a a, a nice uh, smooth pk profile you have a a, a rather sort of um it looks like a, a sort of a, a hill going down from a mountain to the sea with, with sort of some hills and valleys in it but you try to match overall the c max and the and the overall auc that isn't um perfect in every circumstance, but certainly if you want a low-tech approach, that's the, the the most straightforward approach. But certainly our, our, our preferred method would be to put a either a, a JVC or a femoral line in a rat or a subcutaneous line in, in, in a mouse. Okay, thank but you. It, but it's a great but it's a great question and and something we all battle with. Uh, 
Moving over to the, the skin infection model examples you gave with staff, the question relates to, you talked about PKPD parameters uh, for thigh and lung, and how would these relate to actually treating skin infections? Okay, and actually this is a really great, it's a great question actually, because it, it allows me to talk about about when we're doing PKPD and we haven't got a CFU, um, and I'll give you a great example of that. Lots of the antivirulence factors um, don't impact the CFU at all. So if you've got something which is stopping Staph aureus, for instance, generating, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, generating wounds, uh, but not impacting the bacterial growth, that the CFU is no good at all. So then we use, um, instead of using CFU in our regression curves, we use another because that's only a biomarker of efficacy. We can use any biomarker. The, the, the wound scores I've given you um, are, are one value, but that's a little bit too um, coarse. You only have five grays from one to five. So, so we, have, we would score by, perhaps initially by, by the wound score. We then look at a histological endpoint and, and we would look for re-epithelization. Um, and we would score that from maybe one to 10. Um, and then finally, we could have a, a third score of maybe um, the, the white blood count or some level of a cytokine. And so we then make a composite score of those three other biomarkers. Um, we may mo maybe multiply the, the, the wound image score by the, um, by, by the uh, histological score and then multiply that again by some, some factor of the cytokine. So we have a, a pretty big scale and, uh, uh, so, uh, and, and you use that. So then you compare the dose to this other biomarker. CFUs are only a biomarker of efficacy uh, and and you know you could you could I, I suppose you could use the the, the imaging score the, the other score we've used many times um, and this really is only with the excisional um, wounds because when, when you're look when you're looking for for healing when you have actually a you start off with something with a with a, a, a perfectly round circumference of eight millimeters um, you can actually use the um, the the we use calipers and, and, and very carefully measure the the images um, to, uh, uh, to 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 work out how many square millimeters they they are, and that's actually also uh, we've used to, to 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 rank compounds. So so I I think that the the CFU are purely a, a, an indicator, a biomarker of efficacy. So anything that we believe we can use as a marker of efficacy will will be significant. And 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 the final point is when you're talking about well, it's quite easy with CFUs. We know what stasis is. We know what um, one log drop or two log drop is. Well, you can do those. So so when you're talking about wound, we actually talk about the, the number of days to healing or the number of days to re epithelization uh, and and and. And using those scores, you can get surrogates which for the sort of one and two log drop. Great, uh, thank you, because that actually answers a, a previous question about you know, which endpoints and which models. And, and as you've indicated, there are multiple endpoints you can look at uh, as a measure of efficacy, depending on the therapeutic you're working with. Um, and you ended that a little bit with stasis one log two drop, log drops, which uh, actually pulls into another question. Is a two log decrease really sufficient? And are you not overestimating the potency of the antibiotic? <laughs> um, you got some good questions here. Um, <laughs> so, thank you. So this is a hot topic. Um, the the actual what what the what the relevant numbers are now. I, I think it's very hard to give a. Uh, a solid number. I would say it depends on the organism, it depends on the patient, and it depends on the um, the, the 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 immune status. So in general, we we believe from from a lot of studies. Actually, a lot of these were done by David Andes, but but they've been followed up by by quite a few other people. And I think for for gram positives, I think we're we're quite confident that that for a normally healthy patient, if we see a one log drop. Um, the exposure of a drug that to, to induce a one log drop probably means that the average patient in the community will get better with that dose. When you have patients with um, with additional morbidity or, or additional problems, one log reduction isn't sufficient. And so for gram positives, I think there's pretty robust data that two logs works for when you've got maybe a, a dirtier wound or, or you've got um, uh, um, some other pathology present. For gram negatives, it's it's actually quite tough to know. Um, I'm pretty sure if I had an oncology patient um, that was 
completely neutropenic and they had pseudomonas, I'd be pretty unhappy with a two log, uh, two log drop. Um, but but I think we we the, the reality is the 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 amount of reduction in burden you get is a, is a complicated is it ends up because of a complicated series of interactions. The first thing is. The bacteria, if you've got a drug that's bacteriostatic, you will get very modest reductions in burden. So, so for, the, for, 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 for a bacteriostatic drug, you may at the end of 24 hours, you tend to get a little bit better than stasis, but you may only get half a log below stasis. But actually, clinically, the animals are still running around, they don't become ill. And if you withdrew treatment at that stage, the animals will go on to recover. Um, if a bacteria isn't dividing very rapidly. So if you're getting, we were talking earlier on about what's an acceptable increase in burden. So if you've got a strain that only increases by, by one log, my guess would be that when you treat it over 24 hours, you would only get a, re, a maximum reduction of one log because, because if an act bacteria isn't actively dividing, um, it's unlikely to be killed. Um, so, so this is complicated and also some drugs never will achieve um, the, these, the, these, um, the, 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 these, 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 uh, these, a two log kill. And in, in, in that case, we have to rewrite the rule. So, so one and two log kill really are only for drugs which are, and these terms are, are perhaps I'm using very loosely, um, but, but for bactericidal drugs, a two log drop is normally thought to be sufficient um, for, for most patient groups. But the, but the, the questioner is absolutely right. This is rather empirical. Um, you, 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 there, there is no guarantee that, that two logs is correct. And this is, of course, the reason we do a clinical trial afterwards, because all the, the animal models are trying to tell us is trying to help us estimate this dose to man. In one of my very early slides, slides I put on the estimated dose to man. So, so what that means is that this is what we think a person will require to, to recover. We then go on to do a phase two study where we, we hope to confirm that. And the other thing is when you're doing your dose setting, you give yourself a reasonable margin. So whilst we can work out exactly the dose to cause a, a two log reduction in burden, generally we give maybe 20 or 30 percent more drug than that to give us a, a, a margin and also because we know that if we do if we simulate do Monte Carlo simulation of patients they don't all get this ideal dosing and in fact we know with many drugs only 40 or, or 50 percent of patients actually um, achieve the, the the exposure drug that we would hope to achieve to to, to induce a two log drop. Okay <clears throat> thank you and I, and I know that the next question I know we touched on this um, in the webinar back in June, and, and it's kind of a loaded question for you. Is there any information regarding how predictive each model is, and has there ever been a comparison of in vivo data versus clinical trial outcome? Um, there have been a few, um, uh, and off the top of my head, I can't. I'd like to be able to cite them off the top of my head, and I'm very happy if the questioner drops me an email afterwards to give some papers um, which yes. indicate that specifically. But actually, it is a really great question, and 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 um, there's a, a European IMI grant that has just being actioned. I think it's just going through the final stages of negotiation, and 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 the aim of that grant is actually to generate this information. We often have a very large database of preclinical data. But what is very hard for us to get is, is data which is sort of phase four data, so post phase three. So when the compound is being used in the clinic actively. And so I think we have some great evidence that our data correlates with the phase two and phase three outcomes, but we have much weaker data um, proving that it correlates with when the drug is actually used in the clinic. So after it's been registered, when it goes out and, and, and is being used to treat real patients in real situations by, by, by general practitioners or, or, or physicians who are not involved in the trial. And that's a big gap in the knowledge we have. So I believe for, it's highly predictive of phase two and phase, and phase three, but I really can't tell you beyond that. Okay, um, I guess we both know that vancomycin resistant enterococcus uh, are tough sometimes to model. So the question relates to what do you feel are good models for VRE and what would be your recommendations for a positive control in any of those models? So again, fantastic question. Um, 
VRE is very tough. So we, we do two or three models with it. We have an occasional strain, which causes um, a thigh infection. Uh, uh, and, and that we have to give fairly large numbers. We give about 10 to seven in highly neutropenic animals. Um, we have the odd strain, which works in neutropenic IPsepsis. So you, you render the animals neutropenic with cyclophosphamide, and then you administer the organisms directly into the peritoneal cavity. Um, and that works quite nicely. The animals actually become sick over 24 hours. Um, there are, so, so if you do some of the burn models, and I didn't have time to talk about burn models, so if you use a thermal burn, um, the, the uh, VRE will go quite nicely on the SRs and, and, and make quite a nice biofilm. Um, but, but the really tough question is what do you treat these things with? Actually, there's often nothing. Um, and it's, it's, we often have no positive controls. The VREs that we use are essentially untreatable. Um, I, I don't know, Bill, if you can comment on that with the strains you've used, but the ones that seem to cause diseases in, in the animals we've got are pan-resistant. Right. No, and I agree with you that the animals have to be highly immunocompromised, really high inoculums, particularly in the thigh. Uh, we've tried some of the IP administration and, and the mortality is a little inconsistent. The only other one that I would propose that we do is endocarditis. Uh, where you can get good growth on vegetations. And in that case, really high doses of vanco actually show a little bit, but not much in the way of reduction. Um, yeah, so. Sorry. Yeah, uh, so yeah I, I agree. I mean, you know, and the, the, the big problem is the endocarditis model is a great model, but when you have early... Uh, with, with early compounds, and particularly when they're single species, narrow spectrum compounds, it, it's really tough. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we uh, I, you're right, you can use that model, but that would be a very late stage development model. Right. Um, okay, so I want to remind everybody, if they have a question, to please submit them uh, through the panel on your screen. Um, and then moving on, there's another question concerning, is there a possibility to know that bacteria causing the infection are completely eradicated uh, what about bacteria that become persisters? Can you detect these? Yeah, another great question. Um, so I think there's, there's two parts to that. I think in any inoculum that you use, um, so we put in 10 to the 7 CFU into, into an animal or 10 to the 6 CFU, whatever it is. A portion of those, maybe 1% of those are, when you put them in, they are in some sort of persister state. That's to say that they're not actively dividing. They are, are just sort of sitting there waiting for, for conditions. And, and I think part of the residual burden we see is from these organisms that just don't divide. So the drug can't work unless it's, um, unless it's uh, something like Callistin, which um, works on the, which doesn't require any active um, me me metabolic activity or any gene expression, they they are just going to sit there and they will weather out whether the drug's present, and um, and then when you go to harvest the material, your your thigh or your lung or whatever the material is, you you, you can recover these organisms, um, because they because generally organisms that have been in a uh, a persistent state, when you actually um, uh, supply them with a very rich nutrient source they do start growing the, the other thing we do and and it, it's particularly with staph aureus when you're looking at the the small colony variants we have to incubate the place for many days so you get your first i guess first batch of growth which comes out in a day with a with sort of normal large colonies and then if you continue incubating these plates for six or seven days the, the slow growing variants do start appearing but they're, they're probably are um, a group of organisms that we're unable to recover. Um, with longer studies, you can you can you can do qPCR to try to pull out these non-dividing bacteria or or, or bacteria which, which which maybe don't have a, a decent cell um, uh, cell wall um, remaining on them. Um, but that really is no good because in, in 24 hours, you actually if you do PCR from animals that are actually practically sterilised, you still see a reasonable amount of um, a signal in a, in a PCR reaction. So I, I think it's very tough. This is a I mean whilst we're we're not talking about TB today, but in TB studies. This is a, a particular problem, so we use extended incubation. Okay. Um, there's another question regarding phage, and I'll read the question exactly. Have you tried any phage models yet? And <laughs> I would assume that 
This relates to the infection models you've been talking about, but treatment with phage, but I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. So phage comes in lots of flavors. Um, so, uh, and, and we've worked with all of them. So you have fully wild type phage, and they're a nightmare to work with in the laboratory in the vivarium because uh, I mentioned about cross infection with um, with C. difficile. That's trivial in comparison to cross infection with phage. When we work with wild type phage in the in the um, vivarium, we have the most stringent um, containment conditions possible because we are terrified about contaminated environment. At the end of every phage study, we clean the place down with, we actually ventilate the whole place, including all of our equipment with um, hydrogen peroxide vapor. So we, we, we use phage you can, and you can deliver it by pretty much any route. Um, you get, a, if you deliver it um, orally, you get relatively low um, bioavailability, but, but you get some. Um, we also have done a lot of work where we're just using the empty phages to deliver a, a payload. Um, they're much easier to work with because that's to me is like a, a large molecule. Um, you don't get any replication inside the host. Um, and also people use, use phage license. We, we've used those as well. We're just using the, the, the lytic part of the phage. So, so yes, we use them. They're, they can be highly effective. We, we've got really very nice data um, in thigh infection models and in, um, in lung models. Um, sometimes, uh, depending on the, the PK of the phage, because that's actually something we, we do try to measure. You have to multiply dose uh, for the not certainly for the the phages which um, don't reproduce inside the host. You have to re redose those rather like any other small molecule. So yes, there are some special rules um, uh, uh, in using them, and uh, and at times we also have to do PK. That's PK is actually relatively easy for phages that um, are able to reproduce. So you just use a, a simple uh, plaque assay, uh, but we have to use molecular techniques for um, for, for non-replicative phages. So yes, we use them. We've used them in, in biofilm models. We've used them in, in thigh infection, pneumonia, sepsis. They pretty much, we use them, you know, that, that there's no, we use them very much like any other um, antimicrobial. The only two places where I, I can't provide information on it, and, and the literature is 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 very, uh, um, I guess there's no consensus, is whether they can be used to treat urinary tract infections, whether all phages get through and get get through into the bladder, or, or only some. And also whether you can whether the, the phage is getting to certain sanctuary sites. And when I when I say that, I'm thinking whether they get across the blood-brain barrier. Um, it is unclear to me. There is some literature out there. Some some papers say they can, some say they can't, but but we haven't got experience with that. Okay. We have about five more minutes and a few more questions to go through. Uh, this next question relates to antivirulence drugs. You had mentioned in your talk about the uh, use of antivirulence drugs and using CFU is a readout, and the questioner wants to know that uh, if the drug is successful, it isn't the patient expected to clear the infection, and won't this be reflected by a reduction in CFU in the animal? Absolutely right. It, it depends on, on, on the duration of the model uh, um, uh, and the system. So at times we get uh, um, we get really good clearance with antivirulence compounds, but then if you've got a, a, a severely neutropenic host, and quite often we do work with very neutropenic animals, um, clearance is, is delayed. So of course, for us, the easiest biomarker, the one we understand best is CFU. We always do CFU at the end of an experiment. Um, but at times we, we do look for other surrogates. So so it may be that um, that looking at clearance of CFU is a very blunt weapon. That's to say that you can't really get any good dose responses. You can't really do the, the look at the pharmacodynamics of a of an antivirulence factor. And and so whenever we look for when, whenever we work with antivirulence factors, we try to look for additional surrogates to support the the, the, the bacterial burden. But uh, 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 but if you probably if you run the studies for longer than a, a day, and that's possible for some species, for some bacterial strains, it's really tough. Um, you would get clearance, but we would always use um, probably a second biomarker as well as CFU in, in those models. Right. And would you use more of those for like prevention, so you can look at it in terms of the infection itself didn't establish or did not grow? Yeah, I mean, I think you you know it's. It's down to the purpose of what you're doing. So we, you know, it's very often 
we, we use pretty severe infections quite often and, and antivirals compounds can work very nicely. I mentioned some of the, the skin models. We've done some work with staphylococcal um, uh, antivirants factors and, and it's fine in the skin. Um, you get you get really nice resolution um, of, of wounds with these antivirants factors. Um, but but I think in some of the studies we use, it's it's just it's CFUs are just a bit too crude. That that's all I'd say, and that we, we really do need something a bit more sophisticated at times to get good quality data. Okay. And now one last question. Um, can you please comment on animal testing of drug combinations? The best way to go about that. And you have yeah. two minutes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is a three-hour presentation. Um, so yes, we do it. Um, we, we do it. The, the most critical thing I think we try to do is well, we meant, we talked about earlier on humanizing drugs. We know that combinations are having the right concentration of drug A and drug B in the right place at the right time is critical to get uh, an additive activity or to, 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 to prove that there's some benefit to the combination. So we're absolutely um, obsessive about trying to match the human PK or, or at least understand the PK of the combination. So, so we dose them uh, in some quite exotic ways sometimes to ensure that the exposure is correct. We, we also then look at the sidedness. So we do, um, we do a fixed dose of drug A and a range of doses of drug B, and then we reverse it. We use a, a, a fixed dose of drug B and a range of doses of drug A. So we then do all the dose response curves and we look at the sidedness of, of the activity. Um, so so we, we do a, almost like um, I can say an, 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 uh, an in vivo checkerboard study to prove um, that, that, that the drugs do work in combination. So these are tricky studies. Um, but I uh, said with the in vivo checkerboard and this sort of looking at the 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 the, the, the fixed dose of A, variable dose of B, et cetera, that's the way we would approach it. And then with that, you can get some really robust uh, and supportable data. All right. All right. I think that's about it, Peter. I, I thank you very much for your very informative talk. Uh, there was a lot of information in there. Um, and then I'm sure the audience is very appreciative of the answers you provided to their questions. So I'll turn it back over to the organizers at this point. Thanks a lot, William. Uh, thanks for moderating the Q&A. And uh, thank you, Peter, for sharing your experience with us and with our audience. And in general, both of you, I really appreciate uh, your engagement. You both joined us for two webinars. And I hope uh, the audience um, also appreciates this as much as we do. All right. Um, I would now like to announce our next webinars in October and November. On the 3rd of October, we have Olga Sheniu from the Fundacion Medina, who will present in the webinar about natural product antibiotics. And on the 7th of November, Paul Hergenroter from the University of Illinois will talk about converting gram-positive only compounds into broad-spectrum antibiotics. You can already register for both webinars on the Revive website. This is all from my side. I would like to thank everybody for joining today and for contributing to the discussion. As always, I really hope that this webinar was useful for you and that you will join us again for our future webinars. Make sure to spread the word in your networks and encourage your colleagues to join as well. Thank you and goodbye, everybody.